This is the Trey Blocker Show. Hello everyone and welcome to the Trey Blocker Show. Today we are in High, Texas. Why are we in High? Because this is where the world famous Garrison Brothers Distillery is located and sitting next to me is the legendary Texas whiskey maker, Dan Garrison. Dan? Legendary, wow. You like that? That sounds really important. <laughs> I figured I'd throw that in there. You have become a legend in this industry because you, as your website says, were the first legal bourbon distiller in the state of Texas. Is that right? Yeah. First whiskey in Texas. First whiskey distillery in Texas. We think we're making the finest tasting, highest quality bourbon whiskey in the world today. Oh, there's no doubt about it. So the reason I'm here is because I want to talk about two of my favorite subjects. One being whiskey and two being politics. All right. So let's talk about those things. And I have to warn you, Dan, I am known for my very aggressive, hard-hitting, imposing questioning. So I just, I just wanted to warn you ahead of time so you can brace yourself for a very tough interview. You know, they call me the Barbara Walters of podcasting. Do they really? <laughs> no, no, they actually don't. And probably half my audience just went, Barbara, who? Uh, yeah. All right. So... Here's my first very probing question for you. Uh -huh. What was the inspiration for the name of the distillery? Uh, I am just so self-absorbed that I decided <laughs> to name it after myself. Perfect. I, you that's, know? that's really not true. I had a partner in the business early on, and it was called the, the Garrison Blank Distillery. And my partner's last name was Blank, which I will leave blank. And uh, he left the business. Uh, we had a divorce of sorts. But I'd already ordered the signs. I already had signs all over the place that had the various letters with our names in them. And so I eventually bought out my partner. I gave him a whole bunch of money just to get the hell out of my life. And it worked mm. out for the better for both of us. Right. And we've become friends again after, after a good 10 years. When I bought him out, I borrowed money from my mom and my dad and my brother to buy him out. Mm -hmm. So it became Garrison Brothers Distillery because I was trying to save money on letters for the signs and I already had <laughs> the Garrison Blank Distillery in there. I was just trying to be cheap. So I named it after my family. All right. Well, I was trying to be funny with that question, but that was actually a really good answer. A serious story, huh? <laughs> so the, the, the story that I heard, the legend, the lore of how you came about this business was that when you were 10 years old, you were throwing dice with your buddies and you looked up and said, boys, one of these days I'm going to make myself some bourbon whiskey. <laughs> Is that true? I'm not sure where you read that yeah, one. Yeah, I don't. But you know, I that's do the thing know about the internet these days. Some yeah. of the funding from this business came from a card game. Is that right? That is for that is that is, that true. is true. Those are the facts. Yes. Uh, little known facts. About 1.9 million dollars. I shit you not. Hold on a second. We're gonna have, have to de delve into this. 1.9 million dollars in a card game so when i realized that the business had to expand that we couldn't do it all by ourselves my wife and i had been funding it and funding it and funding it i invited about nine of my best friends to come out here one night and play a card game and i told them to bring their checkbooks with them and the next thing you know the next morning they left and they were investors in garrison brothers distillery nice nice that is a good story so when did you first decide that that you wanted to get into distilling i was uh 40 years old and I had just finished my software marketing career, not by choice. The company I was working for, one of our largest clients was Enron. And so when Enron collapsed, our company went belly up and about 17,000 Texans lost their jobs in one day and I was one of them. Oh, wow. And so I had to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. You've been 40 before, I assume. I have, yes. It's not a good place to be. <laughs> no. You're you're questioning your existence. You're questioning your value to to earth and to God and to your family. And right. it's it's a tough time to be. And that's when I lost my job. And so uh, I had to re kind of reinvent myself. And the first thing I did is I went to Kentucky to go get drunk on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail for a week. Good had idea. A, had a great time, <laughs> but also came back from Kentucky with a business plan. Showed it to my wife, and my wife said. Our family has never been in the liquor business, and we're not going to start now. Mm. <laughs> she's in it now. She's how, in it. how does she feel about it now? She's in it. She's proud of it. Yes, she should be. She's a great ambassador for our company. She's, she's a good girl. That's incredible. So I can only imagine that not only would you need a business plan and, and, a, and a good chunk of change to get a distillery started, what are some of the other hurdles that you face from a legal standpoint? Uh, the complexity of getting the permits you you before you can even apply for your Texas state permit to distill alcohol you have to get a federal permit mm -hmm. the federal permit in my day required reams of paperwork I submitted my federal permit 
to be become a distiller, I submitted it 17 times, and they would send it back to me, C note on page 11, and I'd go to page 11, and they, they, they had circled that the page number was wrong, or that there was a comma splice in the sentence. Huh. It's crazy stuff. Right. It made absolutely no sense. And the only way you can successfully fill out that application is to know the history of prohibition in America, mm. because these documents were written in 1935, right. they haven't been updated, they haven't been modernized, and uh, everything comes out of 1935 when the federal government abandoned their jurisdiction over alcohol and they gave distribution rules and regulations to the states. Mm -hmm. And the states all had to adopt their own code and the states are like, where do we begin? Right. <laughs> How do we do this? Right. And some congressman who was part of the prohibition movement wrote the rules, and that's what all states adopted as their rules. It's basically a three-tier system. The supplier, me, can only sell to a distributor. The distributor can only sell to a retailer. And then in Texas, anyway, the retailer can only sell to the bars, restaurants, or consumers. Right. But everybody got their piece of the pie. Because back then, during Prohibition, the only people that were allowed to sell alcohol were, were pharmaceutical companies. Interesting. If, if you had an illness, if you had recurring headaches, they would prescribe whiskey. And the only place you could get whiskey was the pharmacy. Huh. And if you look at uh, folks like David Jabor and Twin Liquors, I right. mean, that's where they came from. That, they were in the pharmaceutical business. They were the, the local pharmacy before they became the local liquor store. That's interesting. That sounds like a little known fact. I had never heard that. That's amazing. So after 80 years, that three-tiered system is in place the same now as it was then? It is. For the most part? It is. Yeah. And it's been propped up through the years with additional legislation that makes it even more complex to the point where the TABC managers, the personnel that work at TABC, don't even understand their own rules. And it's it's very frustrating for them. They They've been... There's only one group of people on planet Earth that can ta change the TABC code, and that's the elected officials that we've put in office. Right. And every single year it comes up again and again and again that the code is corrupt, the code doesn't make sense, that nobody knows how to, to manage the code, and every single year those legislators kick the can down the street. Right. And they're good people, they're doing a job that nobody else wants to do. It's a tough job. It's a horrible job. And they had the chance this year. This was such an exciting year for us because TABC was under sunset regulation. And uh, that was a, the opportunity we've been waiting for for so long sure. to fix the problems with the code that make no sense to consumers or the TABC administrators at all. And sure so enough, Dan, for the, for the benefit of our, our listeners not familiar with that process, let's go ahead and explain it a little bit. So in Texas, Texas is unique uh, in, in a lot of regards, but in this regard, Texas is unique in the sense that we have a sunset process. So we have a sunset commission that is charged with looking at every state agency every 10 to 12 years and deciding whether it needs to continue or, as the term implies, be sunsetted. Right. which rarely happens. But the intent behind it is to improve the agency, improve the laws behind the agency. And so this legislative session right now, the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission has been under sunset review. Legislation is filed to continue them. And you actually testified in front of the Sunset Commission with regard to this bill. What did you tell them? I'm not really good at keeping my mouth shut. <laughs> and I probably should have been. I explain to them that there are elected officials. We put them in their position because we believe that they would do right. And they are the only ones that can change the code. They're the only ones that can fix it. They're the only ones that can scrap it. We as consumers, as voters, as, as liquor drinkers, we can't do anything about it. Right. And if we question why we can't get a bottle of booze on Sunday, it's because of the code. If we question why we can't, we can order wine, on the internet and have it shipped to our house, but we can't order a bottle of whiskey on the internet and have it shipped to our house. Those are the only folks that can fix it. Right. And it's happened in seven states now where they've struck down that that rule, the direct to consumer shipping issue. Mm -hmm. And in seven states, you can you can join a whiskey club, but you can't in Texas. I can't ship you a bottle of Garrison Brothers. Right. 
and that kind of ticks me off. So I told them that it was their responsibility to change the code, um, that they should do it, and that, that we would be behind them. They're our elected officials. Mm -hmm. it, they're the only ones that can do it. And sure enough, they didn't kick that can on down the road, and we're going to have the TABC operating under the same screwed up structural code for the next 12 years. Well, so let me ask you, the code as it is now, can it be fixed, or is it your opinion that it just needs to be burned and they need to start over from scratch? It's so complicated, nobody understands it. Even the administrators. Not even the regulators. That are burdened with, with enforcing it. They, right. don't, they don't get it. They don't know how to enforce it. So they're on pins and needles. Mm -hmm. The folks I know from the TABC are great people. They're mm -hmm. all wonderful people, and they all want to work for prosperity for Texas, and they want good things to happen in Texas, but they don't know how to enforce it. Just for example, until 2015, there was a law on the books that if you went to a liquor store in Texas and you bought one of those little airplane bottles, those little 50 milliliter bottles, right. You were required by the code to buy two. <laughs> Does okay. that make any sense? It doesn't make any sense, but no. That was in the code. And nobody knows why it was there. Nobody know how, knows how it got there. So it's time to start over. Yeah. Let's go to ground zero. Let's write a code that helps the economy, helps Texas farmers, helps Texas agriculture, helps Texas tourism. Let's write a code that makes Texas competitive with the other states across the country sure. who are allowing direct-to-consumer shipping and who are allowing whiskey clubs. Let's write a code that's good for the businesses and the, and the consumers in Texas. It's easy to do. I, I volunteer. Hello. <laughs> so what you're saying is we need a pro-business free market approach to this industry. Would that be crazy? I, it sounds crazy, Dan. I, I don't know if that's possible. So as we know, and, and we're sitting here in High, Texas, and for the listeners not familiar with High, which is, by the way, H-Y-E, and we'll show you a map on the screen. And I would also point out, this is one of those episodes, if you're one of our listeners who always listens on iTunes or iHeartRadio, it would be in your best interest to go to TreyBlockerShow.com and watch this video because you're going to see some really cool footage of this distillery and the process that goes into making this incredible whiskey. But we are in the middle of the Texas Wine Trail. And years ago, when the laws related to wineries were liberalized and the free market was allowed to flourish, the wineries flourished. And they've been flourishing around here for years and continue to flourish. So but we don't have that. Over 200 wineries in this neighborhood. Right. Um, this area does about 1,700 visitors, unique visitors, every weekend. Mm. It's great for the economy. That's right. That's I don't right. mean to get sidetracked. So, the, the point being, the wine industry has been allowed to do that. They can ship directly. They can sell on Sundays. They can do a lot of things that, that breweries can't do. And even these days, I mean, breweries have become the darling of the legislature to some degree. So, laws have been liberalized for them as well, but not for distilleries. So, what's the problem? Where's the disconnect? You know, because there's a three-tier system, there are very powerful tiers. Mm -hmm. There's the supplier tier, and the supplier tier in the whiskey business is not very powerful. We've only got 120 distilleries in Texas, roughly, I'm okay. guessing, today. And only 10 of those are active in the, the legislative landscape. We formed the Texas Distilled Spirits Association, which is a small group that has very little money. Mm -hmm. doesn't even really have much of a lobbying arm. The lobbying's done by volunteers, basically, because we can't afford to, to pay them. You know, until Tito Beverage established Tito's Vodka, mm -hmm. there were no distilleries in, in the great state of Texas. And that guy, what he did is absolutely astounding and, and amazing. And he is the reason we're all in this today. Without Tito having started that, Tito was really the first craft distillery in the United States. Right. And and now the guy's worth like three billion bucks. So that's, that's not, cool. a bad, not a bad trajectory. What an accomplishment. Yeah, it's amazing. But so we've only been around for 15, 20 years. Okay. We don't have the influence that the wineries have. We don't have the influence that the breweries have. So all of our laws are backwards. Mm -hmm. They've already changed those role, rules and, and corrected them except in the beer industry. That's kind of a complicated one because the breweries can sometimes be their own worst enemy. Um, <laughs> but distilleries are still living in these Byzantine days of, of 1935. Right. That's, that's the, the laws are written to protect the retailers and to protect the distributors, mm. not to protect the suppliers. So this, this set may sound crazy, I suppose, but it would seem to me if wineries can do A, B, and C, breweries should be able to do A, B, and C, and distilleries should be able to do A, B, and C. There should be parity amongst those That's industries. the term. We're all shooting for parity. And, but there's not. There's not. So you, you mentioned that you'd love to see the code itself scrapped and started over, written from scratch, and modernized 
so that we inject some pro-business free market principles into that code. What else would you like to see happen this session? Uh, specific bills, specific legislation. Distilleries are not allowed to participate in festivals, hmm. wine and food festivals. They happen all over the state. There's a Hill Country Wine and Food Festival. There's an Austin Wine and Food Festival. We're not allowed to attend. We're not allowed to bring product. We certainly can't go there and sell product to consumers because we're only allowed to sell product through the three-tier system. Right. So we would like to see a festival bill where distilleries can go to Austin City Limits and sample and sure. give out to customers or sell cocktails to customers. Right. That's what it's all about, right? I That's mean, right. a lot of very famous restaurants have come about because ACL invited them in to participate and to sell their product, and then they, they became legitimate businesses. Right. So we'd like to see that happen. There's currently a, a, uh, a cap on the amount of bottles of bourbon I'm allowed to sell from my little gift shop, which is 30 feet in that direction. I, so the cap is two bottles per person per... 30-day period. Okay. So first of all, there's no way to keep track of that. There's mm -hmm. no software out there that allows you to track who's bought a bottle within 30 days. Even if you take their driver's license number, you can't track that. Right. So what we're doing is manually, we're writing everybody's name down on a sheet. People don't like giving out their driver's license number. No. no. But they have to if they want to buy a bottle of Garrison Brothers. So okay. we've got these sheets and sheets and sheets of everybody's name. And there's absolutely no way that my staff can be asked to go back through all those sheets, thousands of pages of paper mm -hmm. in a given year, mm -hmm. and find out whether Trey Blocker has bought a bottle on this day or that day. There's just no way to track it. So there, there's a yearly limit as well, correct, as, as far as how many bottles you can sell from the distillery? Well, there's a gallon consumption okay. level. So if we sell, I think it's 8,500 gallons of bourbon a year, that's, that's the cap. We're not allowed to sell more than that. So there's already a cap on it. Mm -hmm. Why have a cap on how many bottles people can take away from my distillery? I got folks that come in here from Nebraska and Arizona and Alaska, and it's their first opportunity to ever get Garrison Brothers, and they want to buy a case of, of my bourbon right. or two cases of my bourbon and take it back to all their friends sure. to brag about it. And, uh, and I'm limited to two bottles, and that pisses me off. I could see why. And I believe Senator Don Buckingham, who represents this area in the Texas Hill Country, has filed a bill to do that, correct? She has. God bless Don. Right. Really loved working with Don. She is uh, good to her constituents. Absolutely. And so what else would you like to see? Direct shipment? Direct shipment would be fantastic. In Kentucky, they just passed a law that anybody who goes to a distillery can join a whiskey club. Mm -hmm. And if you join a whiskey club, they'll send you three or four bottles of their product each year. And you get a in the mail, you get a package, a beautifully designed package that's the latest Garrison Brothers whiskey. It's Estacado or it's Honeydew or it's uh, Balmeray. And we could do that here. And I, I would love to do that here. Sure. It helps you engage with your fans. And in today's world of social media and marketing, you have to engage with your fans. You have to become a community and form your own community. Right. And that's what we want to do. And everybody that comes here says, you know, can, can I ship some bottles to my house? And the answer is no because Texas state law prohibits that, because the retailers think we're getting into their business and we're not. They can't ship either. Right. Makes no sense. Right. How can you own a retail store and not have the ability to ship the product? This is the only industry in the world, except for cannabis, mm. where you That's a different episode. Where, yeah. where, <laughs> where, where you can't ship a product to a customer. Sure. Amazon's getting kind of big. I think they might be successful. I suspect. And yeah. I would like to get in the direct shipping game too. Right, right. So why are the Texas legislators prohibiting me or Specs or mm -hmm. Twin Liquors mm -hmm. or Total Wine and More from shipping bottles to customers? That makes absolutely no sense at all. Well, and you know, if, if we're sticking with the three-tiered model, if somebody comes from Nebraska and they visit Garrison Brothers and they want you to ship them a bottle home that they can share with their friends, well, then their friends are going to become fans of your bourbon and they're going to go to their local retailer and they're going to buy it. A so it's good for everybody. Tide raises all the ships Correct. in it, the water. It's good for everybody in each of the tiers. It sure It's is. marketing. Absolutely. All right. Okay. So the other interesting prohibition that's currently on the books is let's pretend today is Sunday and we're sitting here in your living room having this chat at Garrison Brothers and I want to walk over to the gift shop and I want to buy a bottle of bourbon. Sorry, Trey. You can't do that. I can't do that. But I could go down the road to Grape Creek or to Becker Vineyards and I could buy a bottle of wine. You could. Right. Does that make sense? Not to me. 
I don't think so either. Not to me. Yeah, Sunday sales, uh, you know, there's a larger question than just Sunday sales. Everybody believes that the, that the Baptists or the Catholics are opposed to selling booze on Sundays, and that's not the reason that you can't buy a bottle on Sundays. The reason you can't buy a bottle on Sundays is that Budweiser doesn't want you to be drinking whiskey on Sundays. Budweiser wants you to be drinking Budweiser on Sundays because mm. it's NFL football day. Right. And so Budweiser, Anheuser Bush, has lobbyists all around the country that oppose Sunday sales intentionally because they know that they can sell beer on Sundays, but you can't sell the competing product, the competing <laughs> beverage. That's what it's all about. No, right. Nobody really realizes that. So the larger question is, why is the state of Texas telling a liquor store owner in Lubbock who knows all of his customers by name and he knows their shopping habits and he knows when they're going to come into his store why is the state of texas telling him what time he has to be open what days he has to be open and how much he can sell to his customers sure why isn't the state of texas supporting that business owner right by liberating the, these rules and by letting that retailer run his own business it's a very novel idea yeah. Okay. So we are not quite at the halfway point during this legislative session, which runs 140 days every other year. There's a, there's oh, this unique <laughs> this unique opportunity with the TABC sunset bill, and then a variety of other bills that have been filed to affect the issues that you just discussed. How much hope do you have that any good will come from this session with regard to this? <laughs> oh gosh. Halfway through the session, everybody's positive. Everybody's holding hands and singing Kumbaya. And then this week, this coming week, and you know it as well as I do, all hell's going to break loose. <laughs> there are over uh, 100 alcohol bills that have been filed relating to how people can sell spirits, beer, wine. And next week, those will become 40. And the week after that, they'll become 20. Right. Or some legislator will get the bright idea to merge them all into one bill, and then that bill gets kicked out of session. So this is the turning point. And I have had my ass kicked so many times at the Capitol in Austin that I've become a real pessimist. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but I am. I think out of those 100 bills that have been filed relating to alcohol issues, maybe five of them will pass this session. And what's frustrating is that all they're going to do is make the code more complicated. Right. And everybody's got a special interest group that they're out to protect. So I'm, I'm a cynic and I'm sorry. I don't want to be a cynic. I want to be, mom, I'm sorry. <laughs> you raised a good son, but I'm a cynic. You know, I've been working in politics for 20 years, so I, I empathize with your position. It can be frustrating, but let, let me put a little more positive spin on this. We still have some time right? And if our listeners want to make some phone calls or write some letters or in some way affect positive change, do you have any suggestions for them? Call your legislator. Tell them enough is enough. You're sick and tired of the silly alcohol rules. You're tired of being told that you can't buy booze on Sundays. That's ridiculous. You're tired of being told how much you can buy, what you have to pay for it or who you have to buy it from and what hours you're allowed to buy it. That's ridiculous. You're an adult. You're, you're an American and you're a Texan. You have rights and, and your legislators are there to support your rights. So let them know how you feel about this. If you're pissed, tell them you're pissed and they need to fix it. That's great advice. And it's relatively easy, folks, for you to get on the Google and, and find out who your legislators are these days. They actually enjoy hearing from their constituents. I think most people are under the impression that their legislators don't want to hear from them. They do, so call them, email them, don't fax them, nobody does that anymore. But reach out to them and tell them how you feel. And, okay. and I think that's a very good point. So Dan, I appreciate you coming on the show today and talking about these issues. Tell me what you're doing here at the distillery these days that you're excited about. Uh, we are bottling our 2019 vintage of Garrison Brothers Small Batch Bourbon Whiskey. I spent eight hours today with 30 volunteers from all parts of Texas and we had some folks from Canada there we had some folks from Wyoming and Montana that that all came down to bottle bourbon with us and it is so much fun we dance we sing right. we give them breakfast in the morning we give them lunch in the afternoon and every 30 minutes or so we take a quality control sample to make sure that the quality of the bourbon is just as good as it was in the morning in the afternoon so everybody leaves really happy and it's real fun to watch 
these people get along. You know, sure. we, we've got we've got lawyers and doctors and truck drivers and strippers and and country <laughs> country music singers. People have piercings through all of their body, and then there's another guy that's that's totally conservative. It's it's awesome. And they're all getting along. And well, they don't in the morning. They're nervous. Ah. They're looking at each other with these. You know, what's what's going to happen here today? Who are all these weird people? Right. But by noon. They're having a good time, and they'll all be going to dinner tonight in uh -huh. town. And we've recommended some restaurants for them, and I'm going to meet up with some of them later. So it, it's it's a very therapeutic exercise here. We're not just a bourbon distillery; we're a family of bourbon lovers. Uh, we call ourselves the Bourbon Brotherhood, right. and um, it's cool how many people are part of the Brotherhood today. So I've been to a few distilleries in my time all over the world and you've got an incredible place here and I would encourage everybody to come visit Garrison Brothers Distillery in High Texas. And I also noticed when I was looking at your website, I saw something rather unique that I wanted to ask you about. And you mentioned the family and this being a, a family run business and it's a, a family of folks who come from all over who are fans of Garrison Brothers. And you have what I view to be the most beautifully written mission statement. Thank you. Uh, that, that I've ever seen. And it's, I certainly don't see those types of things on many distillery websites. Usually I have my guest, as a tradition on this show, end each episode with some words of wisdom. And I saw a lot of wisdom in those words. So what I would like for you to do, we're going to scroll this on the screen, and I would love for you to read that mission statement as we close this show, if you don't mind. Here at Garrison Brothers, we are a family of bourbon makers and bourbon lovers, fully committed to proving that the finest bourbon whiskey on the planet will be born in the Texas Hill Country. A bourbon that beyond its incredible taste also has the power to fortify friendships and faith while inspiring legendary stories for life. We value God, family, friends, and our country foremost, but we always welcome strangers. We value and respect our leaders, our elders, and each generation that has come before us. We value our children and the children of others, and we strive to always assure their well-being. We will take whatever steps necessary to ensure their safety. We value hard work, integrity, and honesty, and the independence, health, and well-being that result from each. We value the land and that which it produces, and we work to preserve, conserve, and respect the natural resources that make our business worth pursuing and our lives worth living. We value the peace, quiet, and the tranquility that are increasingly difficult to find in the modern world. We like our privacy and our independence. Trey, I'm not a great businessman, but I wrote one hell of a mission statement, didn't That's I? That's incredible. I think yeah. so too. That's and incredible. and whenever I'm asked to do things that I don't want to do, I go back to that and that becomes my guiding light as to what decision I should make. Yeah. Do I want to have this investor on my board? Do I want to have this investor in my business? If they don't believe in that, it's probably not a good fit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Absolutely. This has been the Trey Blocker Show. Please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and visit TreyBlockerShow.com to donate so we can keep fighting to restore sanity to this great nation.